Sometimes people say, I'm too busy to meditate. One person said, I, I don't even have 10 minutes to meditate. I said, you don't have 10 minutes to meditate? He said, no. I said, you need to meditate for 20 minutes then. If you're that busy, if you don't have the time to step back and invest in your own consciousness, you are not going to be able to achieve the totality of your potential. So today we're talking about the power of manifestation. Everyone in this world has goals, dreams, desires, aspirations. If you don't have uh, something you're dreaming about, there's no reason to live. And therefore everyone deep within their heart has a brighter vision of the future, something they're working towards. And that's what drives our journey every single day. And therefore, the question of how to manifest your dreams, how to reach your goals, is like the 64 million Canadian dollar question. And uh, different teachers, different people, different traditions over the ages have given us different insights into how to approach this topic of how to manifest your dreams. But perhaps something which really became widespread in the world and something which really captured people's imagination was The Secret. Has anyone, put your hand up if you've ever read the book, The Secret. Okay, so some of you have read it. So for those of you who have read it, you already know. And for those of you who don't, the author Rhonda Byrne she had gone through an almost roller coaster journey in her life where certain things had not worked out as she had planned. She had gone through ups and downs, twists and turns, many challenges and obstacles. And through all of those obstacles, eventually she felt she had come to understand the secret law of life that no one before had taught her. And that secret law of life that she had felt she had discovered was the law of attraction. She felt that after some time, through her experiences, she had come to the conclusion of how to attract anything, how to manifest anything, how to realize any goal in your life. She wanted to share with the world the secret that you are in complete control of your life. And she summarized her theory in three basic steps. Essentially, her understanding is that everything in the universe vibrates at a certain energy. And she says that if you vibrate at the same energy, you can attract anything you desire. In other words, you have the power from your consciousness to create any reality. There is no power, there is no force, there is no extraneous circumstance which can be a limitation on you if you have fortified your own consciousness. And the three steps that she gave in order to realize all your dreams and manifest anything you desire in the world is number one, ask. Be really, really clear. What is it that you want? What is it that you desire? Be crystal clear about what your aspiration is. And when you ask the universe for that thing, when that thing is constantly going through your mind, oh wow, there's a baby in here. Amazing, manifestation of a baby. Uh, and when that thing is constantly going through your mind and you're constantly petitioning for it, then that's the first step to manifesting your dreams. So this is, you can learn a lesson from this, that if you want to achieve anything in life, it has to become your constant meditation. 
in anything in life, it has to be something that you factor into all your decisions, all your directions that you take in life. This thing has to be there all the time, inspiring you, and everything you do in life should contribute towards that great thing that you're trying to achieve. So the first step, she says, is ask. The second step, she says, to manifesting your dreams and desires is that you have to believe. She says that you have to believe it's happening. You have to believe that this secret is working. You have to believe that the dream you're trying to reach is unfolding before you. And you have to actually believe that that grace is descending upon you. She says the belief is very, very important because it puts you into a mindset in which you attract more and more positive energy towards that desire that you have. And then she says you have to receive. You have to uh, let go of all negative or skeptical thoughts and you just have to completely open yourself up um, to live that reality that you dreamed about. So it sounds simple, isn't it? Ever tried it out? Uh, you can try it out. But what I'm going to ask you just for the next two or three minutes is I just want you to turn to the person next to you in twos or threes, whatever, and just ask each other the question, what part of this do you feel you've experienced? What part of this theory to you stands true? And what part of this theory to you seems not the big, the, the full picture? What part of this theory to you seems to be maybe somewhat lacking or somewhat incomplete? So when you hear about this secret that Rhonda Byrne explains, what of it inspires you? And what of it makes you feel like, nah, I think there's more to it than just this. Can I ask you to do that for a few moments, just for you to reflect on what she's saying? Yeah, I'll give you a couple of moments. Just turn to whoever's next to you, get to know them and talk about the secret. So we just get you back to uh, to have a little bit of discussion on this. Could could some of you share maybe what what of the secret resonates with you with your experience? What of it can you feel like? Yeah, I've experienced this in my life, or this stands true to me. Anyone want to share anything? Um, yes, yes, yes. Oh, you did this? Yeah, okay. Said, four years back, I did like law of attraction. Okay. I'm watching the 4K video of Nathan Philippe and everything. All right. And last year when I was in Church Brown, I was just roaming around at Queen Street and I saw that in video at that time. But I don't know about that I asked ever. But back in mind, I believe it that I am in Canada, I'm roaming around in Canada and I am right now here. Wow, amazing. <laughs> Brilliant. So it worked for you. The secret brought you to Canada. Amazing. Okay. Very good. Yeah. So you, you feel as though you had a desire, you had something in your mind, and that seed of that thought then became your reality, and, and therefore it stands true that if you ask, if you desire. Great. Thank you for sharing. Yes. Yes. Okay, I'll come to that in a second. Okay. <laughs> we're going to come to that in a minute. What's missing? What's missing? Okay. Yeah, that we're going to come to. But I just want to see what experience. Do you have experiences or things in your life or your understandings that confirm that this has some substance? Anyone else? Yes. channeling your energy yeah. in that direction and when you believe that it's going to happen that sort of gets you excited you uh, welcome that energy as well 
So uh, you're more likely to achieve uh, something if you are taking active steps and believe that it's actually happening, happening versus being uh, down about it, wishful thinking. Uh, yeah, so that kind of uh, brings it closer to achieving something. Yeah, so those thoughts then naturally transfer into energy, attention, endeavor, and all of that then naturally means you're much more likely to achieve that thing. So it all begins up there, and then you can see it um, uh, transfers into something practical. Very good, yeah. Anything else? Anyone wants to share? Yes. Okay, that's an excellent point. Yeah, sometimes there's this notion in the world that you have to see something to believe it. But we could also see that belief, faith, trust is not opposed to knowledge or experience, but rather it's the foundation. And when we open ourselves up to the idea that there may be another reality in theory, then we open up ourselves to the opportunity and the prospect of seeing that reality. So therefore, uh, faith is not something that comes from experience always. It can also be something that triggers experience. Great point. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, anyone else before I... Okay. Tell us what step is missing. Yeah. And work towards it. Why something that they do? Yeah, so there has to be practical action. It can't just be something in your mind. Of course, here we said that when it's constantly on your mind, then you're more likely to then act. But your point is that action has to be. Yeah, there's a, there's a story of a man who prayed every single day to God, I want to win the lottery. I want to win the lottery. Like he was relentless. And then at the end of life, he had uh, died without winning the lottery. He came to the pearly gates and said to God, like, I thought you existed. I thought you were responsive. I thought you were kind. You know, I prayed to you every single day. God was like, yeah, I was ready to help you, but at least you could have bought a lottery ticket. <laughs> so sometimes we're kind of like that. We have so many dreams, so many desires, and even when it's playing on our mind, we have to actually have a plan. We have to actually make endeavor. And maybe that needs to be more consciously said. Yeah, brilliant. Anything else do you think that's missing from the secret, from your experience? Is it as easy as this? To just ask, believe, and even endeavor, and then anything you want in life will come? Do you think there are any other things that we have to consider? Or any other things that are there that, yes? Um, so, in my experience uh, with the things that I've manifested for myself, one of them most recently being my apartment, is that when you ask for it and you're believing it, it's not easy at all, in a sense, because for like uh, there are so many emotions, there is so much going on, and with, as human beings, there is a difficulty to always be, you know, relaxed or peaceful or whatever. But that doesn't mean that your belief has to be shaken. You know, you can be upset, you can be tired, you can be all of that, but have your belief very strong and unmovable and I feel like a lot of times with people they they want to distinguish that and they want to be like oh like if I'm believing then I should be happy walking around with like you know happy thoughts and not worry but that's not the case you can mm. worry and you can be upset and you can be fearful but you have that belief and you come back to it over and over again and this practice of coming back to the belief and taking actions at least as they said based on that belief based on um, abundance instead of scarcity is where 
where the manifestation happens. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. There's this sense in which the secret is there, ask, believe and receive. But maybe in the midst of that, there's a lot of uh, things don't always go to plan. There are challenges and maybe sometimes you feel like it's not happening, but to continue on. And so, um, yeah, in that journey of uh, manifesting the secret, there are also many obstacles and uh, things you have to overcome. Thank you so much. Yes. Anyone else? Any? Yes. Okay, excellent. Yes, and we'll actually explore this more. Very good. What I'm going to try to do today in the next 20 minutes, and then I'll open it up for Q&A, is I'm going to share with you three perspectives that the ancient book known as the Bhagavad Gita, uh, how it would respond to this idea of the secret that you can manifest anything. And uh, for those of you who are not aware, the Bhagavad Gita, unfortunately, don't have a copy here. But it's a 5,000 year old, it's a Sanskrit book, it's considered like one of the oldest books of wisdom in the world. In fact, it's said to be the third largest circulated book in the world. The first one is the Bible, and the second one is Harry Potter. Um, and then after that, the Bhagavad Gita comes in. And it's a very powerful book, and in this book, the Bhagavad Gita, Many, many insights are given, which are the foundation of Eastern wisdom, Eastern philosophy. And it's not just a deeply theological book, but a very, very practical book that really uh, addresses and uh, talks to the human condition that we find ourselves in. So everything I'm sharing today is based on the Bhagavad Gita. And we also got some books here, which we'll share with you later on, should you wish to take one away. How does the Bhagavad Gita respond to the secret? Well, the first thing the Bhagavad Gita would say is that there's some truth to the secret. And I think all of us in this room have experienced that there is a power of our own mind. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna basically explains to the listener Arjuna that we have three aspects to our identity. We have a physical body, but then we have a mind but beyond the body and the mind, we are actually the soul which is driving those two coverings. And therefore, we are not the mind and we're not the body, but we're utilizing the mind and the body. Just like I have a computer in front of me and there's a physical machinery and there's also software. But none of that is useful unless there's someone behind it operating it. And so what the Bhagavad Gita says is that the mind is an incredibly powerful tool. And in a beautiful verse in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, for one who has learned to um, control the mind, the mind is the best of friends. But for the one who has failed to do so, the mind will remain the greatest enemy. And so what the Bhagavad Gita really tells us is that our biggest enemy, our biggest block, the thing probably holding us back the most in life is not the government, it's not those annoying people around you that you wish weren't there, it's not the world situation, it's not your health limitations, but actually it's our own mind. And in the world today, people do so much for their body, they do so much for the different external aspects of their life, but they don't actually do much to achieve mental fitness, mental agility, mental clarity. And therefore the Bhagavad Gita says that it's all in the mind. We've heard that. And what does the Bhagavad Gita mean by that? Everything that we see in our life begins with a thought in the mind. Our thoughts, here you can see, lead to actions. 
Our actions lead to habits, to character, and eventually our destiny. This is like super powerful. Like sometimes I do a lot of journaling and uh, I have 25 years of journals now. I never thought I'd be, uh, I thought that was for like teenage kids who had like a crush on someone else. Like that's, that, those are the kind of people who write diaries. But one of my, uh, when I became a monk, one of my mentors encouraged me to journal and write about my thoughts, my observations of life. And it's so amazing because sometimes now I can open up my journal and look at what did I write 20 years ago on this day. And it's fascinating because you can see how all the thoughts, all the ideas, all the dreams that you had at one point in your life over a span of 10, 15, 20 years have fructified into where you are now. And you Sometimes all of us, we have an inner critic, we have an inner negativity, we have an inner voice that's constantly like holding us back. And what the Bhagavad Gita says is when we're able to overcome those mental blocks and unleash the power of the mind, then we can actually achieve amazing things in our life. And so when Rhonda Byrne says in The Secret that it's really our consciousness which creates reality, there's definitely truth in that. So the first thing that we recommend to all people is spend some time every single day training your mind, doing meditation, clarifying your thoughts, understanding your inner narrative. Sometimes people say, I'm too busy to meditate. One person said, I, I don't even have... 10 minutes to meditate. I said, you don't have 10 minutes to meditate? He said, no. I said, you need to meditate for 20 minutes then. <laughs> if you're that busy, if you don't have the time to step back and invest in your own consciousness, you are not going to be able to achieve the totality of your potential. And so what we do as monks, um, take a deep breath, uh, we wake up, at four o'clock every single day. And we utilize those morning hours to basically upgrade, uplift and empower the mind. Because when you win the first battle of the day, which is the battle with your own mind, then every other battle in life becomes winnable. But when we have failed in that battle and when our mind is uh, louder than our aspirations, then uh, in our life we'll end up feeling regrets. What I often share people, as I say, don't give up what you want most for what feels good now. And if we learn that one art of mental strength, whereby we're not giving up what we want most for what feels good now, you can just wait and see how your life will become incredible. And so the Bhagavad Gita says there's definitely some truth to the secret because we see thoughts definitely drive our trajectory in life. But the Bhagavad Gita then goes on to say there's actually more to the truth, more truth to the secret. The secret, though a good idea, though a good concept, if we actually look at our lives and we look at reality, we begin to see that there's maybe something more to manifestation which is beyond my control. And in the Bhagavad Gita, we find a powerful delineation of this science. And what I'll do is I'll try to uh, share this with you. If you imagine a continuum, okay, and on one side of the continuum is destiny. The idea that everything in your life is predestined and you have no control. That you're just a robot, a cog in the machine, everything has already been decided and now you just have to act it out. That could be one extreme. And then we could say on the other side of the continuum is free will. The idea that you can do anything, you can achieve anything, you can, uh, you're empowered to create anything in your life. Those would be like the two extremes. 
So what the ancient sages of the East say is that both extremes are unrealistic. It can't be that everything is destined because we see, we have power over the future. But to say everything is completely free will, that I can do anything I want, also seems a bit unrealistic because thousands and tens of thousands of people may want to become football players for... Do they play football in Canada? Let's just say they do. Football players for Canada. But how many of them will make it? Maybe only a few. Tens and hundreds of thousands of people want to become famous, but maybe a few will go viral. Tens and thousands of people want to become wealthy, but maybe some will only achieve that wealth that they truly desire. So clearly it seems that there are other factors at play deciding our destiny beyond our own free will. That's not to say that free will isn't there and we don't have power, but there is something more to the equation that seems to be conspiring to create my future. And this is how it's explained in the Bhagavad Gita. We are the soul. And what the Bhagavad Gita says is that each one of us in this room are a spiritual being and we have the complete free will to desire, endeavor and put effort into different things different aspirations we may have in our heart. But then what the Bhagavad Gita says is that there is a super consciousness, there's a super soul, there's a divinity, there's a providence, there's a God, whatever you want to call it. There's something higher, something more powerful, and something which is overseeing this universe, which then sanctions and seems to have some kind of power over whether that desire will ultimately manifest into reality. And according to the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita, that super soul or that super consciousness or divinity looks at someone's desire, but then looks also at someone's karma. So this is a very, very interesting concept. According to the sages of the East, when we come into this world, we don't come as a blank slate. According to the sages of the East, this life is just one chapter of a much longer story. And we've had many, many lives prior to this life. And in all of those different lives, we all perform different activities. And the law of karma says that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Yeah. They said, there's a new restaurant in town. It's called Karma. The only catch is there's no menu. You get what you deserve. That's what Karma is, right? So Karma is the idea that we are carrying reactions from a previous life that are then determining our fortunes in this life. Have you noticed how some people just have a certain type of Karma so that even when they don't try hard, things just seem to work out for them in a certain way. And other people seem to have other types of karma sitting on their head, by which they try so hard for certain things, but it never seems to work out according to their plans. And that's what more there is to the secret that we may not read in the book, The Secret. And then it said in the Bhagavad Gita is that once the super soul sanctions one's desires according to desire and karma, then there is a arrangement of nature uh, which then arranges and facilitates something to then happen in your life. So say for example, you want to become really famous and you've got the karma for it, then what will happen is certain things will transpire in your life, doors will open, uh, things will happen, people will come, opportunities will open up by which you can then rise to that fame. Um, but that can only happen if you have the karma for it. And so this is very, very interesting because it helps us to understand that 
when we're not successful in manifesting something, it's not necessarily that there's anything wrong with us. It's just that that is not our karma. That is not the destiny that we're meant to meet in this life. And if divinity, if providence is ultimately compassionate, then it means that even though we haven't manifested a particular dream, it means that there's something much better in store for us, but which may not be in our plan. And therefore, understanding this model that it's not me which is the sole architect of my future helps us to somewhat have a level of peacefulness in our mind to basically understand that, no, there are factors beyond my control. So that's what more there is to the secret that the Bhagavad Gita tells us. But the final and last point I want to make to all of you this evening, and then I'll open it up, is actually the most important thing is there is a secret behind the secret. There is a secret, a truth, an amazing insight of the ancient spiritual traditions that's even more profound than the secret. Most people in this world think that if they're able to activate the law of attraction, their life will be amazing. But what the ancient sages say is even if you know the law of attraction, the secret behind the secret is you should know, identify what is worthy of being attracted. Because most people in this world desire many, many things. Most people have made many, many aspirations and goals for their life. But the most amazing thing is, even when those dreams, desires and aspirations manifest, what they realize is it didn't make me happy. And therefore, the secret behind the secret is not just to be able to attract what you want, but to know what it is really that you're seeking in your deepest essence of your being. And most people haven't asked that question because most people, when they set up their goals and their aspirations for life, they just copy what the world tells them is success. Most people have not created their own definition of success. Most people have simply accepted the definition of success that the world has told us. And you may say, no, no, we're, we're all different. We're different. I'm different. I, I've made a conscious decision. But the messaging of this world, the pressures of this world, the noises of this world are so strong that even on an intellectual level, when we think, no, no, that's not success, we still keep pursuing the goals of success that the world tells us is success. So that someone who's not married by 30 thinks, you know, my life is finished. Or someone who doesn't get a certain type of job thinks I'm a failure. Or someone who decides to, you know, go in a slightly different direction from the mainstream is considered an outcast. These are still very strong messages and the Bhagavad Gita encourages us to break out of these stereotypes of what the world tells us success is and really look deep within our heart to identify what's real success. And the way the Bhagavad Gita helps us to understand success is by first helping us to understand who we are. I already mentioned previously in this talk that according to the scriptures, the body is just a vessel, it's just a machine, it's just a temporary dress that we're wearing. But we are actually uh, a spiritual being within that gross body, utilizing a subtle body to basically act in this world. Now to you, this may just seem like some philosophical point, but how does this change my life? What does this mean for me on a practical level? Uh, how does this... Uh, alter my approach to how I'm desiring things. If you understand this deeply, it changes everything. Because what this basically means 
is that if you want to find happiness, it goes beyond physical gratification, it goes beyond mental and emotional gratification, and if you really want to find happiness, you have to feed the soul. You have to connect on a spiritual level. You have to feed your deeper essence of your being. And so, we're recommended by spiritual teachers to create a life that feels good on the inside, not just one that looks good on the outside. When we think deeply, all of you at university, you're making decisions, you have the ability to design your destiny. Think deeply about what you consider success to be, what's worthy of your energies, what should really be dominating your attention and your time. Because if we simply invest all of our hopes for happiness in material goals, it's said that one of four things will happen. Number one, if you try to find happiness in material things, you may not get it. Because remember, you're not in charge of manifesting everything in this world. And you'll be snookered with futility. And that will bring frustration. But even if you have material goals and you do reach them, what may then happen is insubstantiality. You reach those goals, you achieve your dreams, you uh, find that material aspiration, it appears in your life, and then you realize it doesn't make me happy. It doesn't fulfill my heart. It feels a little bit empty. Or may, what, what may happen is that you aspire for a material goal, you get it, and it's actually really good, but then what happens after some time is that satisfaction fades because everything in this world which is material is ultimately temporary. And if someone finds a type of happiness that really satisfies them and doesn't fade, what we'll experience in life is that every type of material happiness, pleasure, also comes with a concomitant pain and difficulty. And so, according to spiritual teachers of all traditions in the world, the biggest lie in the world is the lie that material achievements, material accolades, material positions, material possessions, material wealth, will make you happy. And it's the biggest lie in the world because even when we experience that this is a lie, still because we're programmed and pushed by the world, we still keep pursuing material things. And therefore, we begin, we continue looking for the right thing, happiness, but in the wrong place. So, the Bhagavad Gita encourages us to understand. Am I sitting here now telling all of you that like, forget your degree, it's useless. Forget your aspirations for a career, it's useless. Forget trying to make money, it's useless. Forget all of these things. Is that what I'm saying to you? No, that's not what I'm saying to you. By all means, have an amazing career. By all means, tap your potential and your abilities and go out there in the world and achieve things. By all means, create a great situation. But don't think that that in and of itself will make you happy. Once you've achieved all of those things, if you use those things in a spiritual way, if you use them in selfless service to others, if you use them in such a way that it makes the world a beautiful place, then those things have meaning. And so it's not that spiritual people are unambitious. It's not that spiritual people don't achieve things in the material world. They do. By all means, they do. 
But when they get those material things and they achieve that material success, they use it for a higher purpose. And that usage of it for a higher purpose is what brings them happiness, not the material success in and of itself. And so, in answer to the secret, the three basic perspectives of the Bhagavad Gita are there's some truth to the secret, for sure the mind is powerful. But there's more to the truth because there are factors be beyond your control which are designing your destiny. But ultimately what the Bhagavad Gita teaches us is that there is a secret behind the secret, that we should step back and look deeply, what am I aspiring for? What am I aiming for in life? And make very, very conscious goals that will allow you to experience spiritual happiness and true fulfillment of the heart. Thank you very much. Those were just some words. <laughs> Thank you for being so patient. I know you've had a whole day of uh, lectures and here is another monk lecturing you. Um, so thank you for being so patient and kind and, and, and taking your time to be here. Um, I guess we have like uh, some time. Yeah, we have a little bit of time, like 10 minutes um, or so, 15 minutes. So if anyone has any questions you'd like to ask or any comments or any reflections, it would be great to hear from you. Yeah, I see a hand at the back. Um, we don't have a mic, right? A roaming mic. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you could just like... Uh, do you believe that astrology and numerology play a role in the karma and uh, destiny? Amazing, yeah. Do I believe that astrology plays a role in karma and destiny? Think of astrology as a medical report. So say, for example, if you get an MRI done, it's MRI, right? Body scan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was not a medic, although I went studied with many medics. Uh, say you get an MRI done and it scans your body. It's not that the report is causing you to be sick. The report is just basically telling you what your sickness is. So astrology is like a report of your karma. Astrology doesn't create your karma. Astrology is basically helping you to understand how your karma will play out in this life. And so in the ancient Vedic body of knowledge, there's, there's a, a department called Jyotish. And in Jyotish, uh, there are said to be 12 houses. I won't go into the whole thing. I know it's intriguing. But uh, there's a whole science behind it whereby when you look at your time of birth and then when you look at other factors surrounding uh, your kind of uh, journey in this life, then you will be able to understand uh, how karma will play out in your life. And it's very powerful. It's very uh, empowering in many ways to know a bit of that journey. But what we always have to understand is that no matter how powerful your karma is, your free will actually um, has the power to even change sometimes your karma as well. So when we have an astrological reading or some sense of this karma is hanging over me, we shouldn't feel like that's the end of the story. There's always an opportunity also to break through that and break beyond that. But sometimes understanding the limitations or understanding certain opportunities in your life through astrology can help you to navigate the journey uh, in a better way. So oftentimes people do astrology um, and astrology can also be used for other things as well. For example, when you're beginning an endeavor to do something through astrology, you can you know, decide an opportune moment to begin that endeavor, or if two people are coming together to spend the rest of their lives together, you can do astrology to judge your compatibility, uh, all that kind of stuff. So, but I'm not an astrologer. And I have to actually share with you, after saying all of this about astrology, I have to share with you that in my life, 
I had the opportunity many, many times to get my astrology done and I never did it. Um, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it. Um, everyone has free will. Um, but I had a sense in which I felt as though astrology would um, impede me from just utilizing my free will and thinking creatively. And therefore, I opted in my life not to, uh, not to go down that route. But you can try it out. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Anyone else have any uh, questions or comments or anything you'd like to know uh, more about? Um, I have a bit of time. Any, uh, yes? Uh, could you speak a little bit more about how to change karma? You mentioning it feels as if. The purpose of karma is education. The reason that we go through certain karmic reactions is because there's the universe is trying to teach us something. If we do a good action, we get a good reaction because the universe is reinforcing that mentality. If we are um, insensitive, impulsive, uh, unkind to others or the environment around us, then the universe reacts with a certain type of reaction to elevate our consciousness. So the idea is that karma is all about education. And so if you learn the lessons, then there's no more need for that karma to come to you. For example, if someone does a crime and they have to go to jail and they're sentenced to 20 years, what sometimes happens is after 10 years, they'll interview the person. And if they feel that that person has reformed themselves, then they may just give them early release because there's no more need to be in jail. The purpose of jail was reformation and that person has achieved the goal. So by reading spiritual literature, by grasping spiritual truths through discussions like this, what happens is we learn many things. And when we learn many things, then the reactions that were meant to come in our life to teach us those things are now redundant because we've already learned it in a better way. Therefore, it's said that the first class person learns by hearing. The second class person learns by seeing. And the third class person learns by experiencing. So it's less painful if you just learn the knowledge in a situation like this. But if we don't learn the knowledge in a situation like this, then what will happen is we'll go out into the world and then we'll learn through the school of hard knocks. And then we'll be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Material things don't actually make me happy. But rather than going through all of that pain and that heartache, it's better if we can grasp the knowledge in a much more um, organic way like this. So therefore, yeah, that's how we change karma, by uplifting our consciousness and by uh, embedding spiritual insight into our hearts. Is that okay? Thank you. Yes? While we're on this subject, could it be said that awareness and meditation sort of play a role in changing your karma? Like say you have a certain karmic habit or like an inclination toward pizza, you get the smell, you immediately rush toward it, there's no self involved, you didn't make the choice, it just pulls you right in. Say if you were to bring awareness to, oh, I have this certain habit, when I smell this certain food, I go right toward it. You, as soon as you notice the smell, it triggers that awareness of, oh, right, in this moment, I have the choice to eat the pizza or continue walking. I, that's sort of like a, a coarse example, but yeah, could we say it like that? Yeah, that's a great point. Let me just uh, see if I can show you something here. Um, just give me one second. I'm going to try and show you something here which might uh, help you to understand this. If I'm going to be able to pull it up, if I'm not, then I'm just going to do something else. Yeah, I can. Okay, great. Amazing. See this picture? So what the, uh, the ancient spiritual literature say is that our existence can be compared to uh, a chariot. So if you think of these five horses, they're the five senses, the eyes, the ears, the tongue, the sight, um, what am I saying? Touch, 
Which one am I missing? Taste. Smell. Did I say smell? Okay, anyway, you, you know what the five are. <laughs> the five horses are like the five senses. The reins are like the mind. The driver is the intelligence. And the passenger is the soul. Now, in an ideal situation, the soul, the passenger, would tell the driver, I want to go here. The driver would control the reins, and then the horses would then gallop in the right way to go where the passenger wants to go. That's what would happen in an ideal world. But for most people in the world, it's the other way around. Because the intelligence is very weak, and the mind is practically uh, hijacked by other things, Basically, the senses are running wild. And therefore, this is not a good thing to do. What happens is our senses are so strong that they then just lead us in a certain direction. And that's why I was sharing that point. Don't give up what you want most for what feels good now. It's amazing. Like, say, for example, cigarette packets. Just, just to give an example. Uh, 30 years ago on a cigarette packet they wrote, smoking may damage your health. After 10 years the message changed, smoking damages your health. After 10 years the message changed, smoking seriously damages your health. And after 10 years the message changed, smoking kills. And the amazing thing is, the sales of cigarettes are getting higher and higher and higher, even though the message is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Why is that? Because the soul, the voice of the soul has practically become non-existent and therefore the intelligence is not powered and thus the senses are basically guiding us to do things which are not in our self-interest. And so the process of meditation is the process whereby we can actually become aware of our spiritual identity and allow the voice of the soul to come through and empower the intelligence so then we make the right decisions in our life. Otherwise, we make decisions which feel good now but create a prison for us in the future. And that's basically why meditation, an understanding of the mind and spiritual knowledge uh, is so powerful. Hope that helps. Thank you so much. Okay, now, now we're kind of getting going and I see so many uh, hands. I'm happy to take it, but I know we're on a time schedule here. So you have to tell me, like, can we... There's three, and then you say, so now we'll have to cancel one out. Okay, we'll, do, we'll do three in the time of two. Is that okay? And All right, real quick. Perhaps that's okay. We're going to maybe move forward so that we can start Yeah, they're going to start signing up. Yeah, you just come forward. Yeah. Yes. Mine is an easy one. What other readings would you recommend, spiritual readings, on our journey? Um, I think there are many incredible, amazing spiritual books in the world on my journey of life. When I was 15, I started having a lot of existential questions of life and I began interfacing with many different books of different religions. And I found, I have to say, I found wisdom in all of them. Even to this day, I kind of go into uh, Waterstones. Do you have Waterstones here? No, you don't. Okay, I go into the bookshop. And uh, I'm, half of my life I spend at airports nowadays, so I'm always looking at what people are writing about. And even the books on the shelves, like the smart thinking, the self-development, I think they have a lot of truth. Of course, as a monk, I come before you, and for me, the book which has uh, guided my life in the most prominent way is the Bhagavad Gita. And therefore, uh, without sounding biased and... Uh, in that way, I have to say that that's the book which has influenced me the most and which I found very, very powerful. So we also have some books here. What I've tried to do in this book is summarize some of the main teachings of the Bhagavad Gita in a way that it addresses the needs, interests and concerns 
of the modern person. And in this book, I've just written some of my, uh, yeah, some articles, some questions and answers on my travels as a monk, something about my journey and what I learned on the way. Um, but yeah, I would recommend definitely the Bhagavad Gita as an incredible book, which I think uh, will give you a lot of deep insight into multi-dimensional aspects of life. Is that okay? Thank you. Yeah, and one and two, and then we'll end there. Yeah. Way of to act. That's the manifest. So uh, we already believe that we are getting something, either it's materialistic or spiritual or anything. But as per the Krishna, you don't have to just think about the. You don't have to believe. Yeah, that action. step. Yeah. Rather than you have to do your karma, you have to do your work, and you will get whatever thing in your destiny. So it's totally opposite. Or it's not, I wouldn't say it's totally opposite, but yes, the Bhagavad Gita would say desire then has to lead to action and endeavor and effort. And once you do the action, the endeavor and effort with the proper intention, then uh, it's not that some kind of mental adjustment like believing it's happening is going to add anything more to the equation. So yeah, the Bhagavad Gita doesn't really talk about this concept that if you believe something, if somehow by mental adjustment you kind of uh, believe, start believing that something is happening that in some way it's more likely to happen. No, the Bhagavad Gita says what drives your future, what drives your reality is your intention, your attention and your action. In other words, do the best you can endeavor and then whatever is meant to manifest will manifest like that is that okay thank you yes Uh, okay, so you're saying that by serving others, by doing selfless acts, in some way do we reduce our baggage of karma? Um, yes, but remember the point I made before was that the main purpose of karma is education. So by serving others, by being selfless, by engendering a better character, if that upgrades our knowledge, our insight, then basically that seva has then performed the purpose of the karma because it's uplifted you to a higher level of living. And so, uh, yes, there are many ways and, and selfless service to others is definitely um, a way in which uh, we can yeah, reduce our karma in that sense. So, yeah, that's definitely true. And... Uh, and so, yeah, the, these are all the components. If I would summarize spirituality in three components, what I would say is it's about uh, wisdom, understanding spiritual wisdom. I would say it's about uh, spiritual practice like meditation. I would say it's about spiritual people, relationships and developing spiritual connection. And then all three of those things should ultimately culminate in selfless service to others. And I think when those four components are in someone's life, their life naturally becomes very, very spiritual. And when your life becomes spiritual, then all material karma uh, ultimately disappears. And with that, I will disappear from your sight. Uh, thank you so much for your kindness, for being here. It's a real honor to be in Toronto with you all. And uh, 
look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much. <laughs>